sermon text and the last sermon in 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 4, and uh, we included verse 16 in the last sermon, but, um, but it sets off the, the next little bit, so we'll read from verse 16. Uh, down to the end of the chapter, the end of the letter. Let's just ask again God's God's blessing. Father, we thank you that um, through your Son, who is the Word of God, you have drawn near to men. We thank you that in him uh, you taught all kinds of people, uh, those who had uh, a great deal of education and also those who had very little. You were able, Lord, to minister to the children as well as to the grown-ups. And we pray, Lord, that you would do the same for us this evening, Uh, that each one of us, Lord, no matter where we are in the spiritual life, no matter how spiritually mature or immature we are, no matter how physically mature or immature we are, that all of us would uh, be helped by you. Lord, may your spirit accompany the word that we would receive grace from Christ. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Okay, so we hear again God's word. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May I not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila. Uh, by the way, Prisca is Priscilla. Prisca is the formal version of Priscilla. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Anesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus, I have left Miletus sick. And do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, as well as Pudens, Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. So we come to uh, the end of 2 Timothy, the end of Paul's communication to the church, his final letter and the end of Paul's life. And he has a final message for us, a final message for Timothy and for us. uh, And it's this, that the Lord stands with us. The Lord stands with us. Um, First point, very simply, is this. As the Lord has been with me, he'll also be with you. And Verse 16, uh, verse we went over last time, uh, Paul reflects on um, what is likely the first hearing in Rome and how nobody was, was with him. Um, but this is set off by the beautiful positive statement in verse 17. At my first defense, nobody stood with me, but the Lord stood with me. And it's so beautifully penetrating because we all have already at some point in our lives experienced the um, abandonment that Paul experienced, not quite in the same way, but we felt our weakness. We felt our vulnerability. We've had friends turn their backs on us. We've had people leave us, whether um, of their own choosing or not of their own choosing. Either way, we've all experienced it. 
that feeling of being completely alone, and we'll, we'll experience it again at some point in this life before we are called home to glory. We, we feel it, and we hope above all hopes that we would know the experience that Paul experienced, that though all forsake us, the Lord would stand with us. Now, Paul has pushed this um, to the extreme. Uh, everything that he's, he's gone through, the shipwrecks, the beatings with sticks, the, the stoning with, with stones, the imprisonments, in all of it, he says, the Lord never left me. He was there with me every step of the way. And now he faces the empire. He stands before, potentially before Nero and this great super force on earth. And he knows that he is facing martyrdom. But even now in the courts of Rome, and with death just on the horizon, he can say, the Lord stood with me. He was with me every step of the way. And what is implicit is he's saying, Timothy, and you, you hear this through the spirit, he will be with you. As he stood with me in all that I've gone through, he will certainly stand with you. In fact, he states it explicitly. We should draw a line from verses 17 down to the benediction in verse 22, because there are two major connections. But the first is this, the Lord stood with me, verse 22, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, just as he has been with me, Timothy, just as he be, has been with me, O oh church, so he'll be with you as God's people, though all forsake us. We can rest in this one blessed hope that the Lord stands with us. The Lord stands with you tonight. The Lord will continue to stand with you every single day until you are called into his heavenly kingdom. As the Lord was with me, he'll be with you. Shortest point I've ever made, I think. Second, the question is this. What does that mean? So the Lord is with me. The Lord is with you. Sounds amazing. But we still feel awful. Uh, it sounds incredible and, and, and comforting. It's okay. The Lord is with us. And yet, everything is still very, very difficult. What exactly does it mean for the Lord to be with us? Is it a feeling? Um, is it a sense of empowerment that comes from beyond us? Well, uh, to say that the Lord is with him, Paul goes on to explain, means this, that the Lord strengthened him to do what was right in the face of evil. That's what it means to say that the Lord is with us. He will strengthen us to do what is right in the face of evil. The Lord, he says, stood with me. What does this mean? He strengthened me. He strengthened me. Now, in Paul's case, uh, this was to fulfill his calling as an apostle. It was to bear witness in the court's of Rome. He says, he allowed me to preach that blessed gospel to all the Gentiles, um, to, to stand in the highest courts of the greatest empire in the world was as though he was preaching to the entire known world. And you have to remember that at this stage, Paul has been in prison for a significant period of time. So his body um, has has been weakened, and uh, he no doubt um, feels the kind of fear and, and the trepidation of what lies ahead of him. He's a man like us with flesh and blood. He has that natural impulse uh, to hold on to, to cling on to life. We all do that. If your life is about to take in, be taken from you, you do anything you can to preserve your life. And so now Paul has a choice. What's he going to do? Is he going to do everything in his power to preserve his life? He could, he could do that. He could say, look, everything you've heard about me, it's not true. Don't worry, I'm not a troublemaker. And he could deny the Lord, but he doesn't deny the Lord. Instead, he finds this extraordinary strength, not just to affirm the Lord Jesus Christ, but to stand in that courtroom, not a friend to stand by him and to proclaim Christ, to muster up the strength for perhaps one last sermon, that all the world might one day fall down before his blessed Savior. And he says this, that this was the deliverance from the mouth 
of the lion in verse 17. He says his confidence in verse 18 that he will be uh, delivered from every evil work is in this, not the removal of trial and pain and torment and fierce enemies, but that the Lord would give him strength that he might be faithful in the midst of them. That's what it means to be delivered by the mouth of a lion. Paul could have succumbed to the temptation to sin, but instead he was faithful to God in a thing that God had given him opportunity to do. Now, children, um, when you read there that God had delivered him from uh, the mouth of the lion, it, it, it sounds like an, an amazing thing, a scary but an amazing thing. Um, and when you grow up, uh, you have those stories, don't you? You read about how David actually, King David, fought lions to protect the sheep. And you think, that's amazing. Um, the lion comes and, and David gives it a black eye and he chucks uh, the lion away. It sounds incredible. And, and here's the thing, you will, uh, throughout your life, have to fight lions, not real physical lions, but you're going to have to fight lions. And you, you adults are going to have to fight lions as well. And our minds go to stories like King David, not just with the lion, but maybe with Goliath. And what we expect is that our life is going to have uh, these amazing, like heroic victories of like chucking the stone at Goliath's head and, and chopping his head off or tearing the, the lion's jaws apart. But one of the things that we learn here from the Apostle Paul is that deliverance from the mouth of the lion is not a conventional victory. The victory is... Paul experienced was the victory to be faithful to God no matter what happened to his body. This was Jesus' great victory in battle as well. Remember Jesus in, in the garden, he prayed that the cup would be taken from him. The cup wasn't taken away and his disciples slept. Jesus before the courts, the Sanhedrin and also um, before the Roman courts, uh, they lied about him. And they did convict him uh, and condemn him to death. Then Jesus at the cross, he didn't <laughs> rise up and call down his angels and destroy his, his enemies. He, he was crucified. And yet he was victorious. Why? He wasn't victorious in a conventional sense. He was saved from the mouth of the lion. He was saved by the draw of the evil one to curse God and die and to simply be faithful, though it meant the giving up of his spirit. This is Jesus' victory. And the same Jesus who has gone through it will help us to do the same. As Paul stands there uh, in that Roman court, Nobody else is with him, but Jesus is there. Jesus saying, Paul, I went through this in the garden. I went through this before Pilate. I went through this before men. And I can strengthen you that you might go through it too. And so Paul breaks out in praise in verse 18. Praise to Christ, a doxology to him. Be glory forever and ever. Glory be to Christ. Why? Why is he praising him from his heart? Because he really, really knows that the Lord Jesus stood with him. But how did he know the Lord Jesus stood with him? Because he was faithful to proclaim him. Because he was faithful to do the thing that God had asked him to do. The presence of the Lord in Paul's life was not a special feeling. It was the strengthening hand of God that he might be faithful no matter what the devil threw at him. And Paul was faithful. This is his great comfort to Timothy. You've got to fight beasts at Ephesus. You've got to fight those proud peacocks, the schismatics, the theological heretics. There are divisions. You're going to feel weak. You're going to be brought to tears, O Timothy. But no matter what, you will not succumb to the mouth of the lion. You will not turn from faithfulness in your ministry. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ stands with you and he will strengthen you that you might be faithful. Notice again the line from verse 17 to verse 22. 
The Lord will be with me as he was also with you. The Lord stood with me, verse 17, verse 22. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Then verse 17 again, the Lord Jesus stood with me and strengthened me and his benediction, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit and grace be with you just as Christ was with me and strengthened me. So Christ will be with you and he will strengthen you. One of the reasons that we get discouraged is because everything feels the same. We hear this promise, the Lord is with you but we have the same struggles and we have the same old battles and we feel the Lord is not with us. The problem is we're looking in the wrong places. His presence and his grace are not found in the removal of us from the battlefield and from the war, but in our faithfulness in the midst of it. And that's going to be unique to each one of you. Paul, as an apostle there in the court, was to proclaim Christ. As a mother in the home, your job is to wake up and point your children to Christ and to love them and to provide for them. As a man or as a woman who goes out to the office, you have a calling to be faithful and to be a witness in the workplace. But his presence is felt in this, that he will give you the grace and strength to be faithful wherever you find yourself. He's not asking you to be something you're not. And he's not asking you to do things that you can't do. He asks this, wherever you are and whatever you have, you are to honor him. This is where the Lord's presence is felt. After everything that you have been through in your life, why are you here tonight? It's an important question. Every pain and tear and circumstance of your life, after everything you've been through, why are you here tonight praising Christ? Because the Lord stood with you. Because the Lord is with you. Because he will continue to stand with you. Come what may. Until that day that he calls you home. As the Lord was with me, he'll be with you. And his presence is felt and is strengthening us to be faithful in the midst of our trials. And then thirdly, um, um, there's this amazing promise. The Lord stood with me, Paul says, and he strengthened me. And he preserves me, verse 18, for his heavenly kingdom. Um, now, the logic goes like this. The Lord stands with us, and what that means is that he will strengthen us to do what is right in the face of evil. And in this way, he will preserve us for the heavenly kingdom. There's something incredibly liberating about this. Paul, Paul couldn't change his circumstances. He was there. All he had to do was know the Lord was with him and be faithful with, with whatever was given him to do, which in his case was, was preaching Christ. And he says, the Lord is with you, and he's going to strengthen you. In whatever situation you find yourself, wherever you are, to simply do the thing that is faithful to him. And if you do that, in this way, you will be preserved. So I was reading um, a book I talked to some of you about on this theme recently, and it was, it was a book on the subject of um, prudence. The book was pointing out that many times we are paralyzed uh, by choice. There are so many choices to make that we, we find ourselves simply standing still and frozen and unable to make a decision. And in part, it's because we always feel responsible for the particular outcomes of the choices that we're going to make, as though the outcomes depended upon us. But the book was saying this, that if you employ prudence, the virtue of prudence, you you really don't have to worry too much about it. You simply go through uh, a kind of checklist. You ask yourself the question, is the decision I'm about to make a just one? Am I giving God his due? And am I giving my fellow man his due in the decision that I'm about to make? Is the decision I'm about to make a temperate decision? Am I being governed by my appetites or am I governing 
my appetites? And is the decision I'm about to make courageous? Is it, is it one of fortitude? Or am I being driven in this decision by fear? And so long as I can say it is courageous and it's just and it's temperate, then it is a decision that is honoring to God and is leading me closer to God. I don't need to worry beyond that. I simply need to make a godly decision there in the moment. And this, this brings liberty into our lives to know this, that all we need to do is put one foot in front of the other, each step of the way asking simple questions right here and right now. How can I honor God? How can I serve him? And how can I love my fellow man? That's all you need to be concerned with. And if you live moment by moment, the Lord with you, strengthening you to do the right thing. And that is your only concern. Am I doing the right thing just here and just now? You will arrive in his heavenly kingdom. The Lord is with us. And what that means is that he is strengthening us to do the right thing there in the moment. We focus on simply doing the right thing there in the moment. You don't need to worry about the rest. And the Lord will see to it that we are preserved and we are delivered into his heavenly kingdom. Paul could have worried about all of the various outcomes at the trial, but he knew there was one thing to be done, one thing that would honor his God and fulfill his calling. And he chose it. And his life was preserved and was carried into the heavenly kingdom. Whether we are Timothy in Ephesus, whether a mother in the home, whether we are seeking to discern the future, or a child growing up in the world trying to make sense of it all, then for it all, we have this help. That the Lord stands with us. He will strengthen us to do what is right in the face of evil. And in this way, he will preserve us for his heavenly kingdom. Amen.